Okay, welcome back. So we have the, the fourth lecture about dark matter by Tracy Slater. Okay, much better. Uh, just to check again, can people at the back hear me okay? Okay, great. All right, so welcome to the last of my four lectures on dark matter. In this lecture, I'm going to mostly focus on terrestrial searches, whereas in the previous lecture, I talked about searches that you can do using telescopes. Today, I'm mostly going to talk about searches that you can do in the, in the lab. I will, however, sneak in a couple of cosmological searches because I like them. And so, so what I want to focus on, so most of this lecture, what I want to focus on is the WIMP direct detection program. This doesn't strictly only apply to WIMPs, but that's its main focus. It's a big active experimental program with many experiments with competing techniques. I want to talk you through the basic mechanics of how those experiments, uh, you know, how, how they work, what they're expecting to see, what kind of signatures you can look for. Then I want to talk more briefly about the collider searches for dark matter currently ongoing and of the searches for axions, which again in the last couple of years has become a particularly rich field with many ideas for how to go after the axion dark matter. But before we get to that, I want to finish up what I, was to what I promised to tell you about yesterday, which is the indirect, indirect detection ways in which the annihilation or decay products of dark matter could potentially affect the cosmological history that you've been hearing about in Barbara's lectures. Okay, so you're now all experts on this, so I don't need to spend very much time on it. But between around, well, this is redshift um, 30 to 1,000, but that's even a bit of an overestimate. Between the epochs of recombination and reionization, the universe was extremely close to neutral. The residual ionization fraction Turns out, I mean, you can work it out. It's not zero, but it's a few times 10 to the minus four. So only a few hydrogen atoms in every 10,000 are ionized. Now we can measure that low level of ionization very sensitively using the cosmic microwave background radiation, which you've heard a bit about from me and Barbara, and you're going to hear more about over the next week and a half. We now have fantastically precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation. If you add any more free electrons between us and the surface of last scattering, those free electrons act as a screen to the CMB. So by measuring the CMB anisotropies, we can put pretty strong constraints on them. So there's a constraint that you can set on dark matter annihilation or decay just by saying, well, would it ionize the universe too much at early times? Now, by early times here during the cosmic dark ages, um, we said, you know, the temperature of the universe at the surface of last scattering is about 2,700 Kelvin. That translates into an energy scale of about 1 eV, the CMB. So I told you back in the first lecture that dark matter, thermal dark matter typically freezes out when the temperature of the universe is about um, a 20th of the dark matter mass. So if we're talking about 100 GeV dark matter, freeze out happens long, long before any of the times that I'm talking about here. So you might say, all right, well, the annihilation is frozen out, so there's no annihilation happening anymore, right? So how, how can this be a big effect? The point is that even long after freeze out, freeze out just means that dark matter annihilation is no longer significantly depleting the amount of dark matter in the universe. But it's still ongoing. There's still this slow trickle of production of high energy particles if dark matter annihilates everywhere in the universe and at all times. And we could do a back of the envelope calculation to understand what this might do in terms of ionization. Point here is basically that if you can convert all your, all your mass into energy, that corresponds to a lot of hydrogen ionizations. Suppose, just to make the numbers easy, let's say we were talking about 5 GeV dark matter. So that means since the mass density of dark matter is about five times the mass density of protons and neutrons, that means that there's about one dark matter particle for every baryon in the universe, if this was our mass scale. A, dark, a single dark matter annihilation will give you 10 GeV of energy. Approximating 13.6 EV is about 10 EV. That means that for every annihilation, I can ionize 10 to the 9 hydrogen atoms. So if one dark matter particle in 10 to the 9 were to annihilate at the same time, that's enough power to ionize every hydrogen atom in the universe. 
Okay? So even though the fraction of dark matter annihilating can be absolutely minuscule, this is way after freeze out is not affecting the abundance of dark matter. There's so much energy locked up in the dark matter that even a tiny fraction of it can have very substantial effects. Now, this did not happen. We would be able to tell if the universe had been completely ionized during the cosmic dark ages because we wouldn't see the CMB. But that means that we can use this, to set, this argument to set constraints on dark matter annihilation. Now, so the physical process here is that if dark matter annihilates and produces standard model particles, so long as they're not neutrinos, then when they decay, they'll make pro photons and electrons and positrons. Those photons, electrons, and positrons can, in principle, put energy into ionization. Now, there is some um, astrophysics slash cosmology in this step because you need to understand the efficiency of this process. If I just give you a 5 GeV photon and put it into the universe at redshift 1000, its ionization cross-section is absolutely tiny. It doesn't actually look like it's a very efficient ionizer. But these particles, they'll scatter off the CMB, they'll scatter off the gas, they cool down, they lose their energy, they partition their energy into many lower energy particles, and those particles can be efficient ionizers. Once we, have, once we know how the ionization history is modified, there are publicly available tools, like the class code, or the CAM code, to understand how that translates into a perturbation to the CMB and isotropies. The essential physics is just we have extra electrons, those extra electrons scatter the CMB photons. Okay? So I'm going to summarize a lot of this calculation because it's just you know, a lot of numerics, but it basically just involves numerically simulating the cooling of these processes in the early universe. It turns out that, um, that essentially you can boil all this down to just one number, some efficiency factor for each dark matter model that tells you about how well, it, how well it ionizes the universe. That efficiency factor comes mostly from just understanding what fraction of the power goes into photons, electrons, and positrons versus neutrinos. If a lot of power goes into neutrinos, you don't see much of a signal. But it also depends somewhat on the energy of those particles that you produce. This is the dependence on energy of this efficiency factor. So this is based on, again, a numerical calculation, simulation that cooling. This is for, um, I think this is for photons. This is for electron-positron pairs. You see that this number sort of varies over about an order of magnitude between about 0.1 and 1, this efficiency factor. So it's an order one factor. Now, okay, so, I, so I'll show you in a moment what constraints we get from using the cosmic microwave background to look at this. But first, I just want to tell you briefly about another excess in indirect detection that got a lot of attention a couple of years ago and is still quite interesting at the moment. So, so moving away from the early universe back to the present day, there are, exper there are experiments called PAMELA and AMSO2 that measure the cosmic rays in the neighborhood of the Earth. And what the PAMELA experiment found back in 2008 was that if you look at the ratio of positrons to electrons in these cosmic rays, then it falls as a function of energy up to some point, but then around 10 GeV, this trend turns around and it starts going up. That's a little bit unexpected from standard cosmic ray propagation models, just because the positrons are mostly produced as secondaries from protons hitting the gas. The electrons are primary particles. You naively expect there to be more high-energy electrons than high-energy positrons. That said, there are possibilities for explaining this that have nothing to do with dark matter and are just, well, cosmic ray propagation is modified somehow, or there's some additional astrophysical source of positrons. But one possible explanation for this would be that dark matter particles are annihilating. Since dark matter is neutral, it produces positrons and electrons in equal quantities. You can see this ratio is, um, you know, there are still a lot more, there are a lot more electrons than positrons, even though there are more positrons than you might have expected. So if you had a big source of, that was 50% positrons and electrons, it could have this observed effect. And this was later confirmed by the AMSO2 experiment a couple of years ago, now with um, extremely, now with pretty small error bars, and they see this extends up to about 500 GeV. So this would need to be TV scale or heavier dark matter to work. You also, it also needs to have a very large annihilation cross-section, much, much larger than the thermal relic cross-section, 
by typically two to three orders of magnitude. That can be explained if dark matter has the kind of physics that we talked about in the context of self-interaction on Monday, that it is coupled to some light mediator that enhances its annihilation. This plot on the right is showing the fit for various dark matter models that have been fed to the data. So it can do a reasonable job. But then you can ask the question, OK, suppose I take these electrons and positrons, and I just transpose them to the early universe. I say that whatever, that there's a dark matter annihilation process that is making electrons and positrons that generate this signal. If I were to inject at the same rate those electrons and positrons into the early universe, what would that do to the CMB? So, um, so it turns out that that distortion effect is actually, at least in, in this naive translation, appears to be already ruled out by the Planck experiment. So this plot on the left, the y-axis is this efficiency factor I mentioned that describes the efficiency by which the dark matter annihilation uh, gets converted into ionization power times the cross-section. On the, um, the x-axis, this is the mass of the dark matter in GeV. And as you might have guessed from our sort of initial first order of magnitude estimate, this is a very strong constraint for light dark matter for a few GV dark matter. So everything above this blue line is ruled out. This red band is roughly for, you know, a range of FF between about, I think about 0.2 and 0.7 or 8, which is most of the standard model channels. This is where the thermal, this is what F effective times sigma V would be for a thermal relic particle. So underlying annihilation cross-section two or three times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. And then you multiply by a reasonable efficiency factor. So what this tells you is that this appears to just pretty much rule out for most channels annihilating dark matter below, with masses below about 20 GeV unless, um, unless it annihilates mostly to neutrinos. At the high mass end, these gray dots are models that had been tuned to fit the Pamela and AMSO2 excesses, and you can see that they're above this blue line. Uh, incidentally, these gray stars down here, which are all below the line, are models which fit, which fit the GV excess with dark matter annihilation. So you can't quite reach those with these kind of probe. This plot on the right actually puts in the F effective values for various standard model annihilation channels. These red lines are annihilation straight to photons or electrons and positrons. This band of densely clustered lines here is all the other standard model, possible standard model final states except neutrinos. So one of the nice things about this constraint about this early universe limit, you don't care about dark matter structure formation. It's all coming from times when the universe was neutral, when structure formation was linear, when perturbations had not gotten very big yet. And it's also almost independent of the annihilation channel. You can apply anything above this band is ruled out, regardless of whether you're annihilating to W bosons or quarks or some combination, or some combination of the two or three-body final states. They're all in this band. This, uh, ba this brown band up here is actually the limit for neutrinos. Uh, the reason you have a limit for neutrinos at all is because if you produce sufficiently high energy neutrinos, they can radiate electroweak gauge bosons. And when those particles decay, they produce photons and positrons. It's kind of amusing that this bound is actually pretty comparable to the limits that the ice cube neutrino experiment sets from looking directly at galaxy clusters in the present day. So we can get comparable constraints by on one hand, using neutrino telescopes, and on the other hand, just saying, well, if we had high-energy neutrinos, there have to be other high-energy particles with them, and those high-energy particles would have ionized the universe too much at early times. I think this is a really neat demonstration of just how good our understanding of the early universe has become. And on this plot, these dots, again, represent models that fit that Pamela and AMSO2 excess with annihilation. You should compare the red dots to the red lines, and this gray region and yellow region to this band. And you see, again, they appear to be pretty cleanly ruled out. You can avoid these CMB constraints if the dark matter annihilation rate is really suppressed at low velocities. You can avoid, but then it's hard to generate the positron signal. You can avoid the conclusion that the positron signal is ruled out if we're sitting close to a big lump of dark matter, and that's enhancing the local rate for positrons, but wouldn't enhance the annihilation rate in the CMB. But if you don't make assumptions like that, then this is a pretty clean way of disfavoring the dark matter explanation for that excess.
Okay. So that's all I wanted to say about that. The point I want to make is just, if dark matter annihilates or decays, it provides a source of heating and ionization that occurs everywhere in the universe over the whole age of the universe. And that's one example of how it can have interesting effects. It could also modify nucleosynthesis, modify reionization. It could play a role in most of the special epochs that you heard about in the cosmology talks. So there, belatedly, is my summary of yesterday's lecture. <laughs> which is essentially that um, standard model particles produced by dark matter interactions could give you a right, wide range of observable signals. They could modify the cosmic history in interesting ways. There are a couple of current possible signals that have caused a lot of excitement in the field. I argue to you that this first one is probably telling us about a new point source population rather than dark matter annihilation. And um, the second one, well, well, we will see Hopefully, we can get more experimental information on that in the near future. OK, so now, so now let's move on. So OK, first I'll ask if people have questions about this. Then we will talk about Earth-based experiments. OK, everyone good with indirect detection? OK, so let me talk about, so now let me talk about terrestrial searches for dark matter and Earth-based experiments. Okay, so what's the basic idea of direct detection? Well, so this is the summary plot for direct detection. This is the current status of the field. Most of what we do for the next half hour or so is going to be understanding, uh, understanding this plot and exactly what it's telling us. The basic idea is that what you want to look for is nuclei jumping or recoiling with no apparent cause. So visible particles moving in a way that doesn't appear to conserve energy and momentum, because in that case, you can infer that they, ha they, they just struck something invisible, something invisible, such as dark matter. So the strategy for this is you take a large volume of matter, you put very sensitive detectors around that large volume. Typically, you choose a material such that the nuclear recoil has some visible effect. It might produce low energy scintillation photons, it might produce ionization in the material, it might produce phonons, for example. You bury your detector underground to get it away from cosmic ray backgrounds because you don't want your nuclei to recoil due to anything other than dark matter hitting them. And, um, and then you sit there, and then you sit there and wait. Now, it's worth noticing that what I've described to you could also be used as a way to detect the cosmic neutrino background. We know, there are, we know that there are weakly interacting particles out there that can't be shielded out. And there is, in fact, a point at which these experiments will run into the point where their major background is cosmic neutrinos. We're not there yet, but we will get there in the next few years. So when you run these experiments and you see no signal, you get a lemma plot that looks something like this. So again, here there's the dark matter mass, in, um, dark matter mass on the x-axis in GV. On the y-axis is a measure of the scattering cross, what's called the, the WIMP nucleon scattering cross-section. So this is the inferred cross-section for scattering between the WIMP and a proton or an individual proton or a neutron. There are some assumptions that go into this number. We'll work it out. But what I want you to notice here is that, so this black line is the current bound, is the current best limit from the LUX experiment. And we'll understand the shape of this plot and why the constraint just comes. So you can see a few things. One, you can see that this constraint gets much, much, much weaker below about 5 GV. There's a simple reason for that. We'll understand it on the next couple of slides. But at higher masses, this, can, this is an extraordinary constraint. The minimum of this curve is constraining cross-sections you know, several times 10 to the minus 46 square centimeters. As I said, um, as I said back on Monday, when we talked about self-interaction cross-sections, this is um, when we talked about the kinds of cross-sections that you would need to have observable impacts on the bullet cluster to change the nature of dwarf galaxies. Those cross-sections are 20 orders of magnitude bigger than this. If the dark matter interacted just through exchange of a Z boson, if it interacted naively like, you know, like a neutrino, we would have seen that years, we would have seen that years ago that we've been past that point for a long time. This is cutting deep into the parameter space of weak scale interactions. So, so, that's, so why are these direct detection experiments so very sensitive? Okay. 
So let's go through the math. So direct detection is nice and simple. We're just going to do classical kinematics for the next 20 minutes. It's to first order, you can just treat this as essentially like the collision of two billiard balls. You have a dark matter particle come in, it bounces off a nucleus in your detector. All you want to look at is what is the recoil energy of this detector. So your observable is how many scatterings do you have with a given recoil energy for the nucleus. So let's work out the classical kinematics in this frame. We can write down our equations for conservation of energy and momentum. We'll do in the lab frame first, so we'll say the nucleus is at rest to start off with. We're interested in what its, and what its energy is after it recoils. So then we can just write down our, this, everything's non-relativistic here. The dark, matters, dark matter in our halo, we believe, is going at about 200 kilometers per second, so which is about 10 to the minus 3 times C. So it's fine to ignore relativistic effects. Nucleus is suddenly not relativistic. So if we just write down our energy and momentum equations and then manipulate it, as I'm sure you've all done in undergrad, then we end up finding that the, that the recoil energy is given by the reduced mass of the system, squared, the velocity of the incoming particle, squared, an angular factor, and it's also determined by the mass of the, of the nucleus. So we can see a couple of things from this already. So that tells us that for a, given dark for a given velocity of a dark matter particle, we should see some spectrum of recoils extending from zero energy up to this maximum recoil energy. So we can, another way to say this is that if I fix the recoil energy, then only dark matter particles with a velocity higher than some minimum velocity can contribute. Now, there does come a point if you push the recoil energy high enough where there's a cutoff because that minimum velocity is higher than the escape velocity of particles from the Milky Way. So anything that was high, that was high energy, any dark matter particle that had high enough velocity to give you a very high recoil energy would already have escaped. But, but, let's, but, let's just do some quick, but let's just do some quick estimates here of what kind of recoil energies that we're talking about. So let's suppose, I mean, you saw on that plot our best constraints were sort of for 10 GV and up. So let's imagine that our, so let's imagine, well, okay, let's not even specify the dark matter mass yet. When we're talking about the target nucleus, we, we have many options for target nuclei, but most of, the, but the order of magnitude of the total of the atomic mass is going to be somewhere around the range of 10 to 100, okay? Maybe a couple of hundred. It's going to be somewhere in that ballpark. So let's, Let's suppose first that the dark matter is of a similar mass or heavier to, that, um, to the target nucleus. In that case, the reduced mass is set mostly by the mass of the target nucleus. So we'll just approximate this reduced mass as about mn, which I mean the nucleus mass. As I said previously, the velocity dispersion of dark matter locally is just set by our galactic potential. You can read it off from the rotation curves. And we estimate that it's about 10 to the minus 3. So that means that the typical recoil energies are just of order v squared times what well, we're setting mu equal to mn, so it's just like the nuclear mass times v squared. So that corresponds, so that's about 10 to the minus 6 times the nuclear mass, so we're looking at sort of 10 to 100 keV recoil energies. So if you design an experiment like this, you need to be able to see recoils at that, at that scale. This is your basic requirement for dark matter direct detection experiments. And no matter how heavy you make your dark matter, you're just not going to get recoil energies much bigger than that. On the other hand, we assumed here that the dark matter was heavier than the target nucleus. If you go the other direction, if you make the dark matter very light relative to the nucleus, now the, now the reduced mass is going to be set by the dark matter mass. So compared to what we had before, you're going to get a suppression which is like the dark matter mass divided by the nucleus squared. So if we say that, okay, we had a nuclear, we had a target which was 100 GeV in mass, so a nucleus that has an atomic mass of 100 or so, then if we were looking for 1 GeV dark matter scattering this, the recoil energy that we were looking at would only be 0.01 keV. That's extremely hard to see. 10 to 100 keV is doable, 
much lower than that gets, gets very difficult. So if we want to go after light DM, then we preferentially want light targets and, uh, and extremely low energy thresholds. So this behavior is why that limit plot that I showed you has that very, very sharp cutoff at energies below, at energies below about 10 GeV. That, was in, that limit comes from LUX, which is a xenon-based experiment, which has an atomic mass of about 100. Once the dark matter mass gets too far below that scale, the limit just dies. The recoil energy that you need is just too low to be observable by LUX, which has a threshold of several keV. OK, any questions about these parametrics before we move on? OK, good. I hope that means that everyone is comfortable with classical energy and momentum conservation as opposed to everyone is confused and or didn't get enough coffee. OK, so, like I, okay. so that gives us our general picture. Our spectrum is going to extend up to a few tens or 100 keV. But what will that spectrum look like? I mean, this is what we actually want to look for as an observable. So what ingredients go into this before we actually go ahead and calculate it? Well, first, we need to know how does dark matter scatter on individual nucleons. So there's some particle physics in this. You know, what is the fundamental coupling of the dark matter to the particles present in a nucleus, to the quarks, to the gluons? But there's also a nuclear physics element, which is, OK, if I tell you that my dark matter couples in some way to the up and down of strange quarks, you know, we, we say that protons and neutrons are up, up, down, or whatever. But in reality, the quark content of the nucleon is a bit more complicated than that. They behave as if they have some significant component of strange quarks, for example. So you need to know that. And there's actually been some interesting progress in QCD and lattice calculations over the last few years, improving these estimates of the quark content of the nucleon. When I wrote a paper on this, which was the very first paper of my PhD um, about eight years ago, the error bars on these parameters were sort of order one. But my understanding is they've gotten much better since then. OK, so once you know that, you know how if I scattered my dark matter particle off a proton, how it would behave. But then I need to translate this into scattering off a collection of protons and neutrons that are bound together. So there's some particle physics in this question again. And one of those questions is, OK, how do these amplitudes add when I put them together? What do they depend on? Are they all just identical? Do they just add together coherently? That's the situation that you classically have with spin, with spin independent scattering. But you can have situations where the scattering amplitude depends on the spin of the nucleon that you're hitting. Spins for nucleons occur in, in pairs as you may remember from your quantum mechanics classes. So then in that case, most of the contributions from most of the nucleons actually cancel out. And you get a much smaller cross-section that is just determined on the unpaired spins. Likewise, you have the question, well, is, is this scattering cross, is this amplitude, is it approximately the same for protons and neutrons? Some dark matter particles will only couple to protons. They only couple to charge. Um, there's a... There's a flavor of dark matter in the literature that was designed to try to explain why some other experiments were seeing hints of signal and the xenon experiments weren't seeing anything, which was dubbed xenophobic dark matter, with the idea being that if you tune the couplings to protons and neutrons correctly and they have the opposite cyan, you can cause it to hate scattering on xenon and love scattering on everything else, which is um, advantageous in a way because our most sensitive experiments are made with xenon. It would just be a really unfortunate coincidence if the universe worked like this. But, but in principle, you can have those kinds of cancellations where um, the contributions from protons and neutrons actually interfere with each other. There's, again, some nuclear physics at this step, um, the so-called nuclear form factor, which basically accounts for the fact that the nucleus is not a point particle. It has a finite size. The protons and neutrons bound in it have some individual momentum of their own. This suppresses scatterings where the momentum transfer is much larger than the characteristic momentum scale of the nucleus. OK? OK, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the approximation with that later. And then lastly, to convert this into an observable quantity, we need to say, OK, I've got my, I know if I had an individual dark matter particle and I scattered off this nucleus, what would happen? 
But then I need to understand how does that translate into a rate. So to do that, I need to know about how many dark matter particles are passing through my detector at any given time and with what velocities. Because you just saw the spectrum of recall energies is going to depend on the velocity of the dark matter particles. So we also, so this kind, so just predicting what you'll see in this direct detection experiment relies on, under, on both having a particle physics model, but also on understanding the nuclear physics and understanding the dark matter astrophysics. Now, the way that this is traditionally done and the way that we make limit plots like the one on the earlier slide is to make a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions. Now, the main thing that I just want to establish here is these are all assumptions. They're not necessarily true. They allow you to write down a simple constraint on the scattering cross-section, but many of the sort of modifications to dark matter models or novel dark matter models that people have come up with in the last few years are essentially just going back to this list of assumptions and saying, what if this assumption was wrong? Okay. So the usual assumptions are first, you say, all right, we're going to assume that this scattering, whatever it is, it doesn't, the, scatter, the scattering amplitude itself doesn't depend on the velocity the particles are going at, it doesn't depend on the momentum transfer, it doesn't depend on the scattering angle, it's just some simple isotropic contact interaction. We also often further assume that the coupling to neutrons and the coupling to protons are just completely identical. Dark matter doesn't care about whether you're interacting with something charged or not. Of course, this is an assumption. We usually separate out these two cases of spin-independent or spin-dependent interactions just because the constraints are very, very different, the two cases. In the case of spin-independent interactions, all the contributions from different nucleons add coherently. So if this assumption is true, if neutrons and protons contribute equally, then the overall rate scales as the square of the atomic mass. For spin-dependent interactions, the overall rate just scales as the net spin of the nucleus squared, which is much smaller. For the form factor, this is what I said earlier, this is what it does. Typically, for most studies, people just use a simple analytic parameterization called the Helm form factor. To do this more carefully, you want to actually take results based on, you want to probably take numerical fits to nuclear scattering data at low energies. And lastly, for the dark matter velocity distribution to make these plots, people typically just assume that the dark matter is in so, that the dark matter speed follows some Maxwellian distribution, isotropic in the frame of the galaxy, with some characteristic velocity, which is typically taken to be about 220 kilometers per second. Okay. Now, any um, now. Pretty much any of these assumptions could be wrong, and some of them are just approximations which are definitely wrong at some level, like these last two. So many non-standard dark matter models work just by changing one or more of these assumptions, and the reason that this is important is when you're comparing, for example, a constraint from a xenon experiment to something that you think might be a signal in a sodium iodide experiment, it can make, it can make a big difference what you assume for this. If experiments have different numbers of protons and neutrons, then it matters what the relative proton-neutron couplings are. If experiments have different target masses, then it matters what you think the velocity of the particles in the halo is, because the translation between, between um, the, the, the recoil energy spectrum depends on both the mass and the velocity of the particles in the halo. Okay, but let's, but, with all those caveats, let's go ahead and do the standard calculation because it's good to see it and understand where it comes from. Okay, so first, this is sort of the easiest, simplest ingredient. This is, so this is the so-called form factor. This is a plot of the Helm form factor for A equals 130. So this is a numerical fit to some data. Um, you don't need to memorize this we're not, or write it down. We're not going to use it. It's just so you can see, I mean, this is basically like a, a Bessel function. This is just, a, this is just a, not even a Bessel function, this is just a simple trig function. This, so this plot, you can see this form factor is one at zero momentum transfer. So the x-axis here is describing the momentum transfer in the, <coughs> in the interaction. It starts to become, it starts to diverge significantly from one when you go up to momentum transfer scales that correspond to about one femtometer. That corresponds to a transfer of momentum around about 100 MeV. Now, the, now, we said earlier this momentum transfer 
is, um, is typical. So the scale of this momentum transfer is about the dark matter mass times the velocity. We know the velocity is about 10 to the minus 3. So this becomes a pretty important effect for heavy dark matter matter above about 100 GV. For light dark matter, you can essentially ignore the form factor for heavy, and including the uncertainties in the form factor. For heavy dark matter, it's important because you start getting these significant suppressions in the rain. We'll use that later. Okay, so let's do the standard calculation. Again, we're going to do standard classical scattering theory. This time we're going to switch to the center of mass frame rather than the lab frame. The reason for that is that when I say, all right, I want my scattering to be, my scattering matrix element to be simple and isotropic, it only really makes sense to demand that it be isotropic in the center of momentum frame. The fundamental particle physics doesn't know which frame is your lab frame, but it does know what the center of momentum frame is. Okay. So, so, this is, so this is our configuration. Particles some come in with some equal and opposite three momenta P. After scattering, they have some equal and opposite three momenta K. The momentum transfer, which is just the momentum of an individual, the difference between the momentum of one of these particles before and after the scattering, is given by this vector quantity. We can write it in terms of the reduced mass of the system and the relative velocity between the two particles and the scattering angle theta. Okay. Now we can now remember our observable quantity was the recoil energy in the lab frame. Okay, our, our experiment is in the lab frame. Our nucleus at rest is initially at rest in the lab frame. That's where we're going to measure the recoil energy. Okay, so that's related to the momentum transfer uh, by this by this relationship. So you can check just by. Um, as, I mean, this is, as you can check, just by going back to the lab frame. So if I want to write my observable lab frame recoil energy in terms of the center of mass frame, the center of momentum frame scattering angle, I can write down this equation. So when I want to ask what is the number of events at a given recoil energy in my lab frame, I can recast it as just the differential rate by scattering angle in the center of momentum frame with this prefactor that depends on the reduced mass of the system, the relative velocity of the particles, and the target mass. Okay, we good? Okay, so let's, I'm just going to do this for spin-independent scattering. The spin-dependent scattering case is pretty similar. It's just that you need to keep track of the fact that most of the contributions cancel out. So the overall rate is much smaller. Um, so let's just do spin-dependent scattering. So then let's say, okay, Let's write down, let's parameterize our scattering amplitude for scattering on the nucleus as this is our, this is our form factor. This is our factor that's going to describe the finite size of the nucleus and this function of the momentum transfer. And then we're going to get a contribution from the protons, which all add coherently. From each proton, we get a contribution of Fp. And Z is the atomic number, number of protons. And then we get a contribution from the neutrons. And there are A minus Z neutrons, where A is the atomic mass, Z is the atomic number. Okay, so then now if we say, okay, this is our matrix element, let's work out our differential cross section. So if you've done my scattering theory, you can just work out the math. I should say here, I mean, I'm saying this is the contribution from each nucleon, but it's still possible at this stage that these contributions could depend on the mass of the whole nucleus, for example. This is just a parameterization. Okay, so I so I can write down I can write down this expression. I haven't justified this expression, but it's a standard scattering theory calculation. Okay, so now so now I have my differential cross section by angle, but what I want is my differential rate of events by angle. But you can, but my scattering rate is just going to be the number density of the dark matter particles, okay, times the velocity of which the dark matter particles are hitting the target. So this is a, um, so this is essentially, so this N and V factor is essentially the flux of dark matter particles onto the target. That's the rate to hit a single target atom. That's the rate at which dark matter particles will encounter a single target nucleus. So then we need to multiply by what I'm calling NT here, the number of target nuclei in your sample. If I were to multiply by number density here, this would be a rate per unit volume, but I'm actually just interested in, to in total rate here. Okay, so I'm just multiplying by the total number of targets, not the number density. So then, 
if we just put all these factors together, plug them into this equation and do a little bit of algebra, then we end up with an expression like this for our observable quantity. So, because um, this d omega is just d cos theta times d d phi. I can write down an expression for my observable quantity in terms of these f coefficients, which describe the particle physics coupling between the nucleons and, uh, and the dark matter. Okay. Any questions at this stage? Okay. So then, so okay, but you still have this question. Okay, here's here's my spectrum, and I could, and I, I mean, this is this is a useful formula. I could go ahead compute these these coefficients from my particle physics theory. Go ahead and work out the spectrum. But you might still ask, well, okay, but how does this translate to this nucleon dark matter cross section that we appear to be constraining on the first page? So that's just a definition. Let's call this the effective cross section for scattering on a single nucleon. We'll say that if um, we'll call so we'll call this sigma chi lowercase n, where lowercase n means nucleon, uppercase n means nucleus. So we'll take this to be the scattering cross section on the nucleus on the whole thing where we had, if we had zero momentum transfer, and so we didn't have to worry about the form factor. Okay, so we're just basically throwing out the form factor from this calculation. We saw here that this cross-section is proportional to the reduced mass squared of the, nuclear, of, the sister, of the nucleus dark matter system. So we're going to divide out by that reduced mass squared, multiply by the reduced mass squared that you would have if you only had a dark matter nucleon system, and then divide out by this factor of 1 over a squared, which would map onto the factor that you'd get here if you said, okay, well, let's, um, well, let's assume that fp is equal to fn. Then this factor here would just be a times fn, which would appear, which would appear as a square in the cross-section. So you will get dependence on a squared times fn squared. So this is just a definition. It may or may not have, in a given model, it may or may not have any direct physical meaning essentially a sort of average over all the nucleons in the nucleus of what their contributions to the cross-section is. That is the quantity that is being bounded when we write those limit plots. It's this conventionally defined nucleon cross-section, nucleon dark matter scattering cross-section. And the reason that we do it this way is that it allows you to make sensible comparisons between experiments that have very different numbers of nucleons because this usually does map to something that is almost a that is almost independent of the number of nucleons in your target nucleus. So if we make this replacement, then we can write down our observable spectrum in this form. This is just a substitution from the equation that we had on the previous page. Since we can write the momentum transfer totally in terms of the energy recoil, I've just written the form factor as a function of the energy recoil here, not the momentum transfer. So then we have this expression. And that is the expression. So this is now the expression. So this sigma, this is what's being plotted. This is what we constrain. This is how we constrain it. This, a cross-section of a given size leads directly to this observable spectrum. OK. But we, but we should pause for a moment, because here I've been treating the velocity of the dark, the relative velocity of the dark matter and the um, and the nucleus, as though it was just something I knew, just one number. You know, I've measured the velocity of the dark matter coming in. I've said it's, you know, 300 kilometers per second. Okay, now we can go ahead and work out the cross section. But in reality, of course, this isn't true. I, I, I mean, I'm never going to know the velocity of a given dark matter particle. All I can hope to do is say there's some distribution for the incoming dark matter part for the velocities of the incoming dark matter particles, and then I need to integrate over this distribution to get my total rate. So then, we, so then we can rewrite, so then we can rewrite this expression, this dr, der. We can write what I previously was just a factor of one over v as an integral over a probability distribution for the dark matter, for the relative speed between the dark matter particle and the nucleus. So this f is just a probability distribution for that speed. It has to integrate to one. Okay, so now this is a convenient form for the cross-section because we've really 
separated off the different uncertainties. This piece, so we have this first piece here. This depends on the mass of, on the atomic mass of the target nucleus. Depends on, yeah, well, so this is really another factor of A. This is, it depends on the number of target nuclei you have, so how big your system is. This combination, um, Mn times Nt, is basically your total mass in the target. And, uh, and it depends on the form factor, which, again, depends on the, on the properties of the nucleus that you're dealing with, on how big a nucleus it is. So these all tell you, these are all things that, in principle, you could know perfectly if you understand your target well enough. Then we have these terms. So this is the cross-section that we want to constrain, the nucleon dark matter uh, cross-section. And you also see here the dark matter mass and the reduced mass of the dark matter nucleon system. These, if we understood, given a dark matter model, I know these things perfectly, given a model for the dark matter particle physics. And then lastly, we have the astrophysics. We have the overall density of dark matter, which tells you about the, um, you know, which tells you about the flux of incoming particles. And we have this integral over the velocity distribution. So this allows us to sort of factor the uncertainties into these three parts. Does that make sense to anyone? Any questions about this? OK. Good, good. So I'm not sure if it's no one, if it's insufficient questions or people are insufficiently caffeinated or I'm just going too slow. But OK, I'll continue. OK, so now we, so now we have this expression. So where in this, so we'd like to know what the shape of this spectrum is. What, en what recall energy should we, look, we be looking at? We said 10 to 100 keV. Where should we focus our efforts? Low energies at high energies? What will how will this spectrum look? We know that this form factor will suppress the spectrum at sufficiently high recoil energies. Low recoil energies is essentially just a factor of one. So what's the other energy recoil dependence? It's a little non-obvious, but it actually shows up in this integral. Because you'll recall, as we said earlier, well, what are the limits of integration on this integral there, from some minimum velocity to some maximum velocity? The maximum velocity is set just by the maximum velocity of the particles in our halo. They're going above a certain speed. They're not sticking around in the Milky Way. The minimum velocity is this expression that we wrote down earlier, and it's just a function of the, re and it's just a function of the recoil energy. These are, these are the slowest moving particles that can give you recoils at a given energy in your detector. Now, there's another point that I've been glossing over a bit here when I, when I wrote down this expression, and that is that when I write down this velocity distribution, if I want a simple isotropic Maxwellian velocity distribution, it only really makes sense to talk about that in the rest frame of our galaxy. There's no reason that the dark matter velocities should all be isotropic in the frame of the Earth. I mean, the Earth is going around the Sun. The Sun is moving around the center of our galaxy. There's no reason to think that dark matter should be coming equally from all directions on the Earth, right? So that means that in reality, when we write down this distribution, so this should be the distribution of velocities as seen by an observer on the Earth. That's what we've assumed it to be. That means it's going to be anisotropic by an amount that um, depends on how fast the sun is moving through the galaxy and how fast the Earth is moving around the sun. And it's also going to be time dependent because that's not a constant relative velocity. The Earth is orbiting around the sun. Its velocity relative to the galactic frame changes over the course of a year. However, those are both relatively small effects. So at first order, I'm going to ignore them and, um, and just show you what happens when we ignore them. And then we'll talk about what happens when you include them. OK, so for the moment, let's ignore escape velocity. Let's treat Vmax as infinite. Let's assume that f of v is isotropic in the frame of the Earth, just because it'll make the integral very easy. So then, so when I say a Maxwellian distribution, this is what I mean for the distribution for a speed. So it's essentially, so it's a, a Gaussian distribution with some appropriate, with some um, characteristic velocity, which is about 220 kilometers per second in the local halo. Then when we do this integral, you can do this integral yourself or plug it into whatever program you like, we get this expression. 
So this is where most of the, en of the energy, of the recoil energy dependence comes from, There's this exponential suppression of the recoil energy uh, with this characteristic scale, which is the same scale that we talked about as the typical scale for recoil energies back in the earlier slide. So what we expect to see from dark matter is a smooth exponentially falling spectrum, which then gets multiplied by the form factor squared. This is from a talk by a representative of the Xenon collaboration, the uh, dark matter meeting a couple of months ago. So this is showing as you change the dark matter mass, what does the spectrum of electron recalls look like? You can see as you go from light dark matter to heavier dark matter, the scale for the recoil energy becomes larger and larger. So you see broader and broader distributions. And eventually for this heavy dark matter where the rate goes to zero down here, that's the form factor kicking in. Okay? So a point to take away from this is low energy sensitivity is really important. It's especially important for light WIMPs where there's just no signal above 10 keV or so. But for all WIMPs, the spectrum is exponentially falling. Often you'll get the best sensitivity from the lowest energies. The problem, of course, is that if you're looking at very low energy recoils, there's a lot of background. And they're just hard to see in the first place. Okay, so that's our observable. We know how to relate. So we've written down our, um, our spectrum in terms of this sigma. We can go ahead and ask, you know, okay, that's our spectrum. What about the total rate? How many scatters do we actually need to see in these experiments? This is the calculation that was sort of done back at the beginning of the direct detection era. So let, let's just do this back of the envelope estimate ourselves. So if we integrate, again, ignoring the form factor, and we just, um, just set the form factor to one, and we integrate over the whole spectrum, we get this expression for the final rate. So let's imagine that we have 100 kilograms of xenon to be our detector. That's about the scale of the current uh, best xenon-based experiments. And we're going to approximate the atomic mass of xenon. You know, it's 132, there is, and there are, around that there are several isotopes. But we'll just approximate it as 100 because we just need an order of magnitude estimate. Okay, so the question is, what WIM nucleon cross-section would you need to have in order to see one event per year for a 100 GeV WIMP? Because if you're much lower than that, then... Well, it's, it's hard to get funding to run your experiment for 20 years on the basis that you might see one event. Okay, so this is going to be our, our possible reach. So what are the ingredients that go into this? Well, so our number of target nuclei. This is Avogadro's number. Well, one mole of xenon is about 100 grams here. We have 100 kilos of it, so that's 1,000 times as much. So our number of targets is going to be Avogadro's number times 1,000. It's about 6 times 10 to the 26. So this is the first factor that gives you, that allows you to do such sensitive searches with these direct detection experiments. We were talking about annihilation. We were talking about dark matter particles scattering with other particles. Those are both very low density objects. Here on the Earth, we can make enormous overdensities of matter if we want. We can cram 10 to the 26 target particles into a reasonably sized space. So that's Part of wide area detection allows you to probe cross-sections that are just vastly smaller than anything that you can do with astrophysics. Okay, what are the other parameters in this expression? We've got the reduced mass. Well, here we're saying that the target and the dark matter are about the same mass, so the reduced mass is half of that. It's about 50 GeV. The reduced mass of the nucleon dark matter system is, well, the reduced mass, when one mass is much smaller than the others, the reduced mass is the smaller of the two, so it's going to be about 1 GeV. The dark matter local density, there are estimates of this. It comes out to about 0.3 or 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter. So we'll use 0.4 as for definiteness. And I told you the typical, the V0, the characteristic velocity of this distribution is about 200 kilometers per second. That's a, um, so we could convert this into units of centimeters in years, since what I want is the rate per year. And we get this number. Just as, a, just as a handy mnemonic that's useful, a year is about pi times 10 to the 7 seconds. It's not exactly, of course, but it's 3.14 times 10 to the 7 seconds. So, Okay, so we put all these numbers together. Those of you with a bit of paper and a pencil can do the estimate yourself. And please do check me on this because I did this quite uh, early in the morning, this morning. So it's possible that I have lost some important factors. But this is what I got when I did it. You just put in all these numbers, you put them together, 
And the number that you end up getting is about, for the rate, is about sigma divided by 10 to the minus 46 square centimeters per year. So we would predict that if I had a cross section of 10 to the minus 45 square centimeters, I would see about 10 events per year. That's not actual, that, and that's not actually a bad estimate. We saw on that first page that our current limits from the xenon experiments are in that ballpark, yeah? Sorry, yeah, so, so the question was, what about the spin-dependent case? Or... Yes, this is the rate for the spin ind yes, this is the rate for the spin independent case. And you'll note that we're benefiting in this spin independent case from the fact that we have this A squared factor out the front. This is coming from the fact that it's spin independent and everything adds coherently and it's giving us four orders of magnitude here. Okay. So yeah, so so the spin the spin D so xenon's not the best target for spin-dependent searches, I think, precisely because it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have much overall spin. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I don't actually have that plot on my slides, I think, although we, it might be peripherally there in the LHC constraints, because the LHC often actually does better than direct detection at constraining models which have spin-dependent scattering. So yeah, this, this is the best case for direct detection. If you look at spin-dependent bounds, they will usually be quite a few orders of magnitude weaker. Because we'd essentially be replacing this A squared with, um, with something, you know, we'd only be getting contributions from the unpaired nucleons. Okay. But these are the basic parametrics of why dark matter can be so, why dark matter direct detection can be so sensitive. You can have many targets and you can have a, you can have a fairly high flux because they're going so fast. All right, so I just said, I said, okay, we're going to make all these approximations about the signal being time independent, so let's go back and just briefly revisit those. I'm not going to do, go through the whole integral because the analytic form of that integral is not super enlightening, but, but we can understand what's going to happen. So first, this finite escape velocity at 500 or 600 kilometers per second, is going to impose an additional cutoff on this spectrum at high recoil energies when the minimum velocity just becomes larger than the escape velocity. Then the rate's actually going to go to zero rather than just being, rather than just being exponentially suppressed. Second though, this time dependence is going to induce an approximately sinusoidal annual modulation in the rate. You can understand this just because this total rate uh, you see has a dependence, has an approximate dependence on V naught here. If you change the typical velocity between the Earth and the dark matter particles, then you will um, th then you will change then you'll change the overall rate. So this is just a sketch. The Sun is moving relative to what we believe to be the approximate rest stream of the galactic halo at about 230 kilometers per second in a direction that we know. The Earth's orbital velocity around the Sun is about 30 kilometers per second. So depending on where the Earth is in its orbit, its, its velocity relative to that overall halo varies from like 200, typical velocity relative to that overall halo varies from like 200 kilometers per second to 260 kilometers per second. That's not a very big effect. And what it leads to is a, is a modulation of a few percent in the annual rate. It also um, shifts the spectrum somewhat. So this is a plot of log of the rate versus e-recoil. And this is the difference between December. This is the difference between December and June. So it tilts. So the effect of taking into account this time dependence is a small few percent level change in the overall rate. And it's a tilt in the, and, and something of a tilt in the spectrum. So this is, some, okay. So suppose I want to go look for this signal, what do I need to do? So I want, so in this kind of spin independent search, I want high A, okay? I want high mass nuclei, unless I'm looking for very light dark matter, in which case the advantage of having high A is um, destroyed by the fact that my recoil energies are really, really, really low and really hard to see. 
I want large volumes. I want to raise that NT factor up as much as I possibly can. Signal just scales directly with the number of target nuclei that I can apply. And I want to reduce my backgrounds as much as possible, especially at low energies. The kinds of backgrounds that you get in these searches, you can have neutrons scattering off the materials. They're neutral particles, in some ways like dark matter. But since neutrons interact much more strongly than dark matter, they, they, can be, they can be shielded against. They don't go very far. Now, you can also have scatters of photons and electrons that make their way into the detector somehow. Now, one challenge in these experiments is making sure that your detection material has extremely low levels of radioactivity, because else, you know, if it has some level of radioactivity, you can't shield out decays that happen inside your detector. There's, it's a neat anecdote that I was told a few years ago. You also have to worry about radioactivity from the shielding itself. Um, in, you, you typically have some small fraction of radioisotopes in lead, for example, and so you put all this lead around your detector to try to block out cosmic rays, but then the lead is itself radioactive and gives you a background. So what they use sometimes to shield these detectors is lead from ancient shipwrecks that has been sitting on the bottom of the ocean and thus has been shielded from cosmic rays for a couple of centuries. So, you know, there is, a, there is a market for retrieving lead from ships that sank hundreds of years ago so that you can use it as a low radioactivity shield for dark matter detection experiments. You sort of wonder what the sailors in those times would have thought if they had known what the eventual outcome of their, of their shipwreck was going to be. So, in the future... So, these photon and electron scatters are less problematic than neutron scatters because they're, in general, because those particles are very light or massless, they'll mostly scatter off the electrons present in the medium, not off the nuclei. So the, the fl current flagship experiments have ways to try to distinguish between the backgrounds coming from these electron recoils and actual nuclear recoils. In the future, as I said earlier, we're also going to have to worry about the cosmic neutrino background, which are, you know, and that is going to be a problem. It's sometimes called the neutrino flaw. It's going to be, we, we're at the moment in the happy case of having essentially zero background. So if we double our volume, we can double our sensitivity in terms of significant. But once you have backgrounds to deal with, if you can remove them at all, your signal to background ratio a signal over square root background ratio will be scaling like square root time, not time. So things will slow down when we hit that point. The current flagship experiments, in the US at least, there are really two major directions. One is experiments like LUX and xenon. These use large quantities of liquid xenon. Liquid xenon is a scintillator material. Nuclear recoils produce low energy photons. They also produce an ionization signal, and you can look for both. The Ratio of ionization to scintillation is quite different for nuclear recalls and electronic recalls. I'll show you a plot of this on the next page. So you can use this to reject those electron recall backgrounds. The other kind of flagship approach is the super CDMS experiment, which uses silicon germanium super semiconductors. In that case, a nuclear recall causes ionization. It also produces phonons. Um, did me. Okay, that says ionization plus photons. It should say phonons. That may be an autocorrect problem. Um, Super CDMS's great advantage is that it can go down to lower mass scales than xenon. So xenon is the high A maximize volume strategy. Super CDMS is the reduce background, reduce energy threshold, try to probe the low mass end strategy, and also reduce A. There are many other experiments using a range of different materials and techniques. These experiments are currently leading in the search to push down that, um, those constraints, but um, there's, there, are, there are a number of other contenders in the field often using very clever, exper very clever experimental methods. At the moment, the only experiment that has a, substan that has a, claim, a strong claim of a detection is the Dama Libra experiment, which actually claimed its detection back in the 1990s. So it's been around for quite it's been around for quite a long time. What they do, this experiment doesn't try 
to remove the backgrounds. It doesn't try to um, take these two approaches to try to separate electronic recoils from nuclear recoils. What they do do is look just directly for this modulation signal, this few percent seasonal effect. And they indeed see a rate of scatters that modulate, that appears to modulate sinusoidally over the course of it with a period of one year and a phase which is about what you would expect from dark matter. I think it's off by about a month, which is about one, one sigma. And this signal is extremely significant, like the galactic center excess that we talked about yesterday. This is about a 10 or 12 sigma signal. So they certainly appear to be seeing something modulate. But um, the, field is, the reason that the field as a whole isn't super excited about this result is that in the absence of background rejection, you can imagine that there might be other quantities that modulate with a period of a year over the course of a year. So, the, I mean, the obvious thing is temperature, for example. Now, the Damalibra experiment, the Damalibra team has done various things to try to exclude many of these seasonal effects, but it's, yeah, but, but it's, it's hard to completely prove a negative, that there is no background that it could possibly be. There are, there are currently experiments being planned in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia at the South Pole to try to reproduce the Dama Libra experiment in the South because the seasons are reversed there, but the cosmology of how is the Earth moving relative to the dark matter halo, that doesn't change. So, you would hope, so if it really is dark matter, you would expect to see the same modulation signal with the same phase showing up in the Southern Hemisphere. If it does, that will be a game changer. And I may come back in a few years and be like, I'm sorry, guys, Dama was right all along. But... Um, I think most people are expecting them to either see nothing or to see a modulation with the opposite phase, but we'll, we'll test it out and see what happens. The other reason that people are skeptical about Dharma is, as we'll see in a slide or two, it's actually very difficult to reconcile this result with the limits from the other experiments. Somebody else should have seen it by now. All right, so just to illustrate a couple of things that I said on this, that last slide. This is an example of how Lux does their background rejection. So this is a plot of what they call S1 versus S2, where S1 is amount of scintillation light and S2 is amount of photoionization. And each of, amount of ionization. And each of these black dots on here is an event. Now, these blue lines from here to here show the sort of 10% to 90% confidence bands for electron recoils. So this is what, where we expect the ratio between S1 and S2 to be for electron recoils. This red band shows what we expect for nuclear recoils, for WIMP-like recoils. You can see that they're reasonably well separated. You can see that there are a ton of events in this electron recoil band and enough that you can estimate what the leakage should be into this red band. And you can see that there are very few events in this red band and in particular there are no events in this bottom half. Of this, of this red nuclear recoil band where you would expect the electron recoil contribution to be small. So this is the kind of thing that allows Lux to set the strong limit that it does. Okay, so where is direct detection going? So this is from a talk late last year by, um, on behalf of the Xenon 1 Tan collaboration. So the liquid xenon experiments, they already have order 100 kilo experiments. They're pushing forward to the ton scale. So this, this green line, I think, is the Lux limit that we just saw. This is an estimate of xenon one ton, which is currently in progress. And this is hoped to say something in 2017, so in the fairly near future. This orange dashed line is the neutrino floor that I told you about, when neutrinos will actually start to become a significant background for these experiments. You can see that it's a couple of orders of magnitude below this next year experiment. I think it's quite possible that we will start to be pushing on that neutrino floor in the next several years. Now, as well as pushing down in sensitivity, there's also a lot of active work at the moment on pushing to this side of the plot, to below this GV scale. Now, as we've just worked out, this nuclear recoil technique is not very effective at probing masses below the GV scale. I don't really have a ton of time to talk about this, so I'm just, going to, uh, I'm just going to point you to these references. And yeah, that you can look at dark matter electron scattering. There are clever tricks involving superconductors and superfluids to try to pull out the scattering of very light dark matter. Okay, 
So now at the end, I just want to say some brief things about collider searches and axion searches. First, any questions about the direct detection side of things, though? Is that a question? Yeah, okay, so the question is, is there a good explanation for the Dharma signal other than dark matter? Well, is there an explanation? I added the good part. There's not a clean, there's not an explanation that is good enough that everyone has said, oh, okay, this is clearly what's going on. We're, we're done. There are several ideas involving things like um, annual modulations in the muon flux at, at, at Grand Sasso. But yeah, there, there's, no, there's no explanation which clearly explains the data. It, it remains a bit of a mystery. So hopefully the confirmatory experiments in the southern hemisphere will tell us something about what's going on, if there is something going on. Okay, so collider searches in a nutshell. So in a collider search, what we're trying to do is collide standard model particles together and produce dark matter particles. So in a sense, this is like the inverse of the annihilation process in the early universe. The problem with this is that if it was literally this process, then all that we would see is you put a beam into the collider and nothing came out, which is not a very interesting signal because, of course, you know, all, all the particles that didn't do this are still going to come out. So this is hard to find. What you can do, though, is look for the signatures of production of these dark matter particles as missing energy and momentum. The way that we typically see particles in the collider is that they decay and then we look at the decay products, but that's not going to happen for dark matter because it's stable on cosmological time scales, so it's certainly stable on the time it takes to get out of the LHC. The searches that people mostly talk about for dark matter at the LHC are of the form mono X searches, by which we just mean you look for a visible particle that appears to be moving in a way that doesn't conserve energy and momentum. So it seems to be recoiling off an invisible partner. This could be like mono Higgs, where the visible thing you look for is the Higgs. Mono jets, where the visible thing you look for is a QCD jet. Or mono photons, where the thing that you look for is a photon. It doesn't fundamentally have to be mono. You can have more than one visible particle or jet in the event as well. Okay. So... At the LHC, we can potentially produce dark matter particles if it's below about the TeV mass scale. If we can produce dark matter under these control conditions, it would allow us to probe the interactions between the dark matter and the standard model in depth. But yeah, this is what I just said. The LHC experiments are beautiful. They're very sophisticated. They do not include dark matter spotting modules. The kinds of processes that you can, that can give you dark matter particles, so you should think of this as essentially just a left to right plot. You can have two standard model. One is you can have standard model particles come in. One of them radiates off a particle, which is a photon, as part of this interaction. Then you pair produce the dark matter, but the kinematics of this final dark matter state is affected by the fact that there's this photon here, and the photon kinematics are affected by the fact that, oh, look, I produced two heavy dark matter particles. You could also have processes like this, where two standard model particles produce other intermediate particles and they decay into dark matter and something else. There are two broad models for looking for dark matter, for trying to set dark matter constraints based on the LHC. One is to say, yeah, question? Yeah, okay, so the question is, are there standard model particles that can decay directly to dark matter? Um, it's possible that, the, that there could be dark matter hiding in the invisible decays of the Higgs, for example. We don't know the Higgs decays as well as we know uh, a lot of other... So if, if the dark matter is pretty light, then standard model particles could potentially decay and produce dark matter particles in their decays. Sorry, so... Yeah, so if, if dark, I mean, you might, yeah, so, right, the Higgs field could mix with another scalar field. It could also have, um, it, it, if you're talking about SUSY dark matter, it will often naturally have some couplings to the Higgs or the other standard model gauge bosons. Depending on, depending on them, if the dark matter's, so if the dark matter's light enough, then it could appear in the decay chains. You can actually set some pretty interesting constraints on light, like tens of GeV dark matter, by saying, well, okay, we have some limits on the invisible width of the Higgs. Yeah? Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, so the question is, do we have estimates on the missing momentum from dark matter versus the missing momentum from neutrinos? Uh, I mean, you, you can predict, given a model, you can predict what the distribution of MET should look like for dark matter particles. You can predict what it should look like for neutrinos from the standard model processes. These are not background free searches. I mean, you, like, you will have standard model events that have the same kind of behavior as dark matter events. So what you're always looking for is some deviation in the distribution of events from the standard model. OK, so two broad approaches for these dark matter searches. One is to say, all right, I'm going to build a detailed top-down model, and then I'm going to search for the signatures of that model as a whole. Now, this can have very striking effects. These models typically contain many particles that are not dark matter. In something like a SUSY model, all or any superpartner that you produce ever will have a decay chain that eventually ends in the LSP, the lighter supersymmetric particle, as well as other particles. So you can see, so you can look for you know, complicated cascade final states which have large amounts of missing energy due to the presence of the dark matter particle. The downside of this approach is you can set constraints on your one specific model, and then if you want to try to constrain a different model, you have to do the whole calculation over again. So it can be harder to generalize. And if you use these kinds of models to guide the kind of searches you do, you worry that maybe you're going to miss a signal because it's not in the set of models that you were looking at. So the LHC experiments have, I think, increasingly been moving towards using this framework of simplified models where they just include a few ingredients and use that to develop generic searches. The upside of this is that these constraints are easy to translate to many models. The downside is that, well, sometimes those extra ingredients in your model are important, and there's no guarantee that the simplified model you write down could be embedded into a reasonable high energy theory. Like, just as an example, um, other particles in your model might significantly affect the relic density of the dark matter. So, so in general, these approaches are complementary. So I just want to show you, this is an example of the kinds of constraints that you can set with the LHC using one of these simplified models. So this is a picture where you just say, OK, let's suppose dark matter couples to some mediator. In this case, they're treating it as an axial vector mediator. Let's look for signatures of this form. And then let's try to exclude parts of the parameter space that are so this is the mediator mass on the x-axis and the dark matter mass on the y-axis. And the regions inside this region here, between these blue lines here and between these purple lines here, are bounded by these different searches. And the scales here are both TeV. So you see that, I mean, where the LHC is good, it can be very good. It can potentially rule out dark matter and couplings to dark matter and particles coupled to dark matter that are right up at the TV or 2 TV scale. It can be very sensitive. Um, however, this tends to depend fairly strongly on the properties of this mediator, whether it's a vector, an axial vector, a scalar, or a pseudoscalar. If we want to combine, if we want to ask the question of which does better, the LHC or direct detection or indirect detection, that's an extremely model-dependent statement. So this is an example for a set of models taken from what's called the phenomenological MSSM, where MSSM means minimal supersymmetric standard model. So this is already a simplified SUSY model. These different colored dots show, so this is a parameter space of a um, scattering cross-section times the, versus the dark matter mass. You see that above this black line, which is sort of the lux bound from direct detection, most models are ruled out. So green means ruled out by direct detection. Red means um, ruled out by both direct detection and indirect detection. Below this line, direct detection can't do much. Purple means you can rule out model, those models with the LHC, but not with direct detection or indirect detection. And you see that over this whole mass range, from sort of the 100 GeV scale up to the few hundred GeV scale, gray points are models that aren't ruled out at all. The LHC can eliminate a lot of models in this range, but there are those that survive. Indirect detection for this particular set of parameters becomes particularly strong at higher masses, where the LHC can't really go because there's just not enough center of mass energy. But we can use experiments like HESS and CTA, as we talked about earlier, to probe and look at gamma rays from those models to probe this high mass range. So blue means um, excluded by indirect detection, but not, but not anything else. OK, so it's pretty much lunchtime, so I'm just going to say super quickly and give you some references for axion searches. So the axion searches in a nutshell slide. Third, 
in a nutshell slide. There's a really good review of this by um, Peter Graham and his collaborators. So if you're interested in Axion searches, this is a good place to start. But the basic framework of most Axion searches is just that in the presence of a magnetic field, the Axion can convert into a photon. This has a couple of implications. It means, that axi it means the photons can travel through regions that should be opaque to them by converting into axions and then back into photons. And it means that it might be possible to catch the cosmological dark matter axions using magnetic fields by converting them into photons or equivalently into electromagnetic fields. Axions have some other interesting effects because um, at least the QCD axion, uh, the parameter that we started this off by saying, well, let's replace the parameter that controls the neutron electric dipole moment with the axion field. So axions can induce nuclear electric dipole moments. You can look for these with NMR, with, uh, you know, originally developed for medical applications. They can also mess up the proton-neutron mass splitting. If you remember our discussion of nucleosynthesis earlier, that helium abundance actually depended fairly sensitively on the proton-neutron mass splitting. So you can use that kind of thing to set cosmological constraints on axions. But if we just focus on these two topics, there's again, there's a range of possibilities here. High energy photons traveling to us from high redshifts can actually, which would normally be absorbed by the extragalactic background light, if they can convert into an axion for part of their journey, they could still get to us. So if we see very high energy photons from very high redshifts, that might point to a cosmological role for axions. You can do experiments light shining through a wall, where, which is just what it sounds like. You would try to get the photon to convert into an axion so that it can go through the wall. In white dwarfs, axions can have a significant effect on stellar cooling. Photons that convert into axions can escape when they would otherwise not be able to escape. And you can set lit and there, there's actually, well, there are some claims that there's maybe a slight discrepancy in white dwarf cooling that could be alleviated by axions right at the level of the bound. On the second front, I'll talk briefly about the ADMX experiment because this is this field's current flagship experiment. But you also have the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, which tries to do this conversion of cosmological axions and look at the resulting photons using the magnetic field of the sun. And there's an experiment which I just have to advertise because it's by my colleagues at MIT, and it has a great acronym, which is Abracadabra, which, uh, where, where the idea is to have a toroidal configuration with an oscillating magnetic field and via undergrad electromagnetism, the presence of an axion induces a slight extra current, which you can look for. Okay. Since I've short time, let me just give the one slide summary of the axion dark matter experiment. So the idea here is that you build a resonant, magnetic, a resonant microwave cavity containing a strong magnetic field. So it's like your microwave at home, except quite a lot more powerful. And what you look at is you look at the output power from this cavity. Now, in this case, the axion photon conversion will occur at the largest rate if the frequency of the magnetic field is a close mass matched to the axion energy. If we're talking about cold dark matter axions here, then they're very, very non-relativistic. So this is basically saying when the frequency of your cavity is equal to the axion mass, then you will, then you will convert um, axions into photons, and you can see those photons from your cavity. The background here is that um, we're talking about very low energy photons here. If you're talking about milli EV axions, then you're also talking about you know, pho photons around the same scale. So there are backgrounds. But this is a bump hunt. The idea is that you change the frequency of your cavity, and as you vary the frequency of your cavity, then as you pass through this resonance, you will see a bump. So if we were to detect something here, we would also automatically have a measurement of the axion mass. And if it's the QCD axion, that automatically tells us about its couplings. This is the, so this is a, from an ADMX paper, their sensitivity. So this is the axion mass on the x-axis. This is the axion coupling to photons, which is mostly controlled by the FA parameter that we were talking about two days ago. This is their preferred region for axion cold dark matter. And blue is the current limits. You will note that they managed to exactly miss the region of interest for cold dark matter searches. But there is a funded upgrade to ADMX currently in progress, which hopes to cut into this region. Now, it's worth noting a caveat when ADMX people show these plots. Um, this 
side of the plot where they have marked too much dark matter. That's assuming that the misalignment angle is order one. Um, if the misalignment angle is very small, then there could actually be cold dark matter axions down in this region as well. And some of the other experiments that I mentioned briefly and posted references to, which you can look up if you're interested, are going to carve into that regime. And that's just what I was talking about earlier with the high energy, with the high energy gamma rays making their way to the Earth. Okay, so thank you very much for staying. I'll let you guys go to lunch. So just to summarize, we can prove the properties of dark matter particles with terrestrial experiments. I've talked about a range of such searches. Something I didn't talk about was the dark photon searches, which are also pretty neat. But we have done enough time. So to conclude this whole sequence of four dark matter lectures, our basic problem, we know that dark matter is 80% of the universe's matter. We don't know what it is. We do know quite a bit about dark matter, though. We have a wider range of gravitational probes that tell us about its properties. We have no shortage of ideas for, dark, for particle dark matter candidates. They fit fairly neatly into a range of expanded models. There are several completely independent possibilities for matching the observations that we currently see. I hope that I've given you a flavor of what's going on in this field and at least pointed you to some useful tools for understanding it. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much for the great questions. Have a great time with the rest of the workshop. Thank you.